It's 6.02, so if we are ready to go. Um, thank you so much for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. I'm Michelle Rapgaver. I'm the Educational Outreach Coordinator with the Arkansas Archaeological Survey. And uh, I'm Jillian Castino. I'm the Society Survey Liaison with um, Arkansas Archaeological Survey as well. And so this is our very first event of 2024 Arkansas Archaeology Month, which is the whole of March. So we're very excited to kick it off here. Um, we've been really excited to work with Jason um, at Lyon and get this up and going. Um, hope that you get a lot out of it. So this is our archaeology jobs panel. We've got four great panelists who will introduce themselves as we get going. Um, and I'm hoping that everyone in the room, oh, we do all the way here, um, are able to hear us well and that people in, uh, uh, on the Zoom call can hear us as well. And if you're on the Zoom call, you can just leave your audio and video off for the time being. But at the end of the um, uh, the official like question section, we'll kind of open it up for audience Q&A. Um, for anybody who wants to, and at that point, if you're on Zoom, um, feel free to turn your camera on, on if you want to ask your person your question like in person. But we also have the chat, um, and if you want to use that at that point, you're welcome to do that too. We are recording this, so hopefully it will be up on the survey's YouTube channel um, within a week or so after the event um, for anybody who couldn't make it at all tonight. Um, so I think. Kind of it for a brief introduction, and we will uh, get the panelists started and then kind of move through, like I said, the questions we have set up. Hopefully, that'll be a good start, and then y'all can ask whatever questions of them that you have. So they've sat themselves in the order they chose, and now <laughs> the consequences of that come through. <laughs> so we're going to start on the end for the first question, and then as we go, we'll start with the next person in line and kind of round robin it. So the same person doesn't have to start every time. Uh, but our first question is just, can you introduce yourself, kind of who you are, where do you work, what do you do, that kind of thing. So we'll start with Mel on the end. Hi, all I'm Mel Zabecki. I'm the Arkansas State Archaeologist. I work with the Arkansas Archaeological Survey. Am I speaking in the right direction? Or do I need to speak in that direction? No. No? Okay. I work uh, um, at the Arkansas Archaeological Survey, and while our survey archaeologists are spread across the state, I am uh, positioned at the University of Arkansas Fayetteville. Is that it? Who you are, where do you work? Yeah. <laughs> That's it. You got it. <laughs> um, hey, guys. Uh, I am Angela Gore. Um, I am a lead archaeologist at SWCA Environmental Consultants. I'm Jason Kennedy. I'm a professor of anthropology here at Lyon with an emphasis on archaeology. Hi, uh, good evening. I'm Megan Wilmots. I'm the National Register of Historic Places Program Manager, and I work in Little Rock. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much for coming, all of you. This is kind of a variety of different jobs and kind of private public sector you hold in archaeology so hopefully it kind of gives you a good idea of some different things but it's obviously for people it's not the whole of what you can do with an archaeology degree or within archaeology so um we'll go to the next question is just what is your first experience in archaeology and how did you get interested in archaeology to start with so we'll start with Angela for that one all right um, so I first got interested in archaeology. Um, I was an undergrad and I didn't know what to do with my life. I took an anthropology class and I really loved it. Um, and I decided to change my major to anthropology and my mom cried when I told her. Um, <laughs> and as a part of our coursework, we had to, it was required that I took uh, an archaeology class. So I took an archaeology class in undergrad and I really loved it. And my professor, um, said, hey, I need some volunteers in my lab. Um, so my first ever experience was volunteering in an archaeology lab, washing artifacts and picking teeny tiny calcium carbonate nodules out of soil samples for hours on end. And I'm still here. <laughs> um, I grew up digging in the dirt. My dad's a plumber, so it was kind of instantly into the dirt. Um, my grandfather had eagles, and I used to kind of play around in the pen with the garden trowel digging out old ham bones and things like that, and calling them dinosaur vertebra. Um, I'm huge into dinosaurs as a five, six year old. Um, I carried that through until I went to an Ar Illinois, Arkansas, or Illinois archeology span event. Um, and I got to sift and kind of play around while they were doing some archeology span outside of the Cahokia complex. 
And from there, I was probably 10 or 11. And from there, it was archaeology. I knew that's what I wanted to do. I uh, pursued it in undergrad, and it's led me here. I'm probably one of the quintessential people in school. They talked about Egypt, and I went, aha, perfect. I love this, except the mummies. I didn't like the mummies, but I wanted, I like the architecture. I like the canoptic jars, right? And so I went, I want to do this forever. And fortunately, I was done with the Egypt phase by about age nine, and I, but the archaeology phase kind of stuck. And I was lucky enough that I lived in Virginia, so I had a lot of different places nearby that I could show up and be a nuisance. And I actually got kicked out of Colonial Williamsburg one time because I was there for too long, <laughs> and I was still here. They never could kick me out of this job, at least. So hopefully, hopefully not. <laughs> hopefully I'll still be here. But yeah. Well, unlike Megan, my Egypt phase did not stop at nine. <laughs> So I was uh, either going to be a sticker store owner or, or, or an archaeologist when I grew up. Um, didn't know how to become an archaeologist, though. I was obsessed with Egypt and mummies, but had no idea that you could actually... I missed the whole part in Indiana Jones where he was actually a, a professor. So I, I thought you had to be independently wealthy to do archaeology. So went to college, um, was going to major in geology because I knew I liked just being outside and digging in the dirt. And, uh, and then I had to take an anthropology class for, uh, you know, for a, uh, an elective and found out, oh my God, uh, yeah, that's an anthropology and archaeology are the same thing. So, um, and then did wind up becoming an Egyptologist for the first part of my career. So, never ended. All right, so our next question then, and we'll start with Jason for this one, is what is your work background? How did you get into the position that you're currently in? And what was your job trajectory? Well, uh, I adjuncted for quite a while doing, holding down multiple gigs at multiple schools, doing the unfortunate adjunct hustle, and uh, finally finished my PhD. Oh, adjuncting, uh, I taught uh, basically by the class. So I would sign up to teach a class, say, at the community college versus at another school. and. At one point, at the height of that, I was teaching at three different schools at the same time. So um, that meant, you know, lots of time on the road trying to make it to those classes. Uh, but uh, once I finished my PhD, things got a little bit easier. And um, but in between that, I took some time off, did some CRM work. Uh, I worked logistics at UPS while I was still working, trying to put everything through, and then finally got the job here at Lion, um, tenure track position, and I'm excited to be here. Building on a program has been really fun. Um, so I, I honestly, I don't know how, why they hired me, uh, but I'm glad they did. Um, desperation. <laughs> desperation. But desperation plays a lot of roles, right? So it worked to the, his benefit. It, yeah, it worked to my benefit. So no, it's been really good. But it was it was a long road with lots of kind of uh, twists and turns to get here. I. My work background is, is everywhere except archaeology. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Republic of Georgia for two years teaching English. And then I came back and I was still an English teacher. And I went, I can't do this anymore. So I switched to doing work in a museum. Still educational things, but at least I wasn't in a classroom 24-7. And at that point, I still went, I, I need to get out of teaching. I do not enjoy this anymore. So I went and I got my master's degree in cultural heritage management. And that was really what allowed me to get the job that I'm in right now because it exposed me to some of the architectural knowledge that I need when I'm doing my work. And that was what really helped me uh, get the job that I'm in now. Um, uh, so I feel like we skipped the question, did we? Educational background. Oh, okay. I'm just making sure that I, I was like going like, wait a minute. I thought, and then I looked down. I'm like, oh, wait, no. Okay, work background, right? Okay. Uh, I've been uh, extremely lucky. Well, okay, no, I haven't finished it. I've been extremely lucky in that all of my work background is in archaeology, but that also makes me unlucky because I don't have any other skills. Um, but basically, uh, I, I I've been very lucky because I. Um, uh, in in undergrad, uh, I was able to, well, I did field schools and stuff, but as soon as I got to grad school, I was able to get a job with a <laughs> cultural resource management firm. So I was I was doing CRM work while I was working on both my bachelor, uh, my master's and my PhD. 
and I, I just kept somehow finding jobs, which is, I think, kind of rare, um, but it, it gave me lots of different kinds of experiences. So CRM work, I, I adjuncted um, for a long time. I, um, I did museum. I was like a museum tour person at the university for a little while. So I kind of just stayed with, within that whole realm. Um, and the, the probably the apex of my archaeology jobs wasn't an archaeology job, but it was at Park and Archaeological State Park as a park interpreter. So it was still archaeology, except I was learning how to teach, so that was really fun. Yeah, my background is um, sort of similar to Mills. Um, I had a lot of volunteer jobs when I was an undergrad. I decided, hey, I want to go to grad school um, and get a PhD in archaeology. And when I was in grad school, I had um, the I had the opportunity to be paid to work on a lot of different professors' projects um, within our university system, and also I got experience on other people's projects because we all kind of like share people in archaeology. We all meet experienced people, you know, in the field. Um, uh, I also, like Mel, worked um, seasonally during the summertime uh, in cultural resource management to to make a little cash uh, <laughs> in the summer when I, you know, around when I was doing my research for my dissertation. Um, so I got, you know, some cultural resource management experience there when I was in grad school. Um, I also adjuncted, I taught university level classes for a few years um, and actually uh, write the year I graduated and uh, got my PhD, um, I started a short uh, a short stint with the survey here um, before uh, leaving and sadly leaving. Yes, um, <laughs> and uh, I have my current position now. Okay, so we'll go back now that we know what you do. What is your educational background? <laughs> what kind of education did you need to get the job that you currently hold? Sort of okay, so my bachelor is in anthropology and history from the College of William and Mary. They didn't kick me out. I came back. <laughs> um, and my master's degree is in cultural heritage management from the University of York in the UK. I did about four field schools while I was in, in both of those degrees in Israel, Ireland, the UK, and Williamsburg. And uh, what really helps me get the job I think that I have now is was that master's degree it kind of checked the box that not a lot of other people had at the time, uh, especially for an entry level position. It was kind of above and beyond what they were looking for. Uh, I got my bachelor's in anthropology from Mount Holyoke College in Western Massachusetts. I came to Arkansas to do my master's in um, anthropology and uh, uh, but my specialty uh, became human remains. So I'm, I'm a bioarchaeologist um, with lots of experience in Egypt. So I did my Egyptian uh, PhD. I did a PhD here at the University of Arkansas, but it was all in Egyptian um, remains. So yeah, bachelor's, master's, PhD, field schools, um, like you mentioned. And what do you need for this job? Yeah, I, the, this, the state archaeologist job requires a PhD. So. Yeah, um, I also have a I have a BA in anthropology and a minor in geology, um, which helped me when I was doing my dissertation research um, because I ended up kind of being like a um, an accidental geologist. Um, a lot of when you're doing a PhD, a lot of things accidentally happen to you, um, like the PhD itself. Um, <laughs> um, most folks in CRM, or you'll also hear it called the industry or the private sector, they're talking about the same thing. They're talking about cultural resource management that's done by, you know, at firms like for profit. Um, I had a PhD traditionally, it, like in the past, it has been like rare for people to have PhDs in the industry, um, mostly people like to to move up and advance in um, in the private sector, you do need an MA. Um, I, I would, I, I think if you would ask me, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, would I be the exception having a PhD? I would have said yes, but now things are changing. Um, now to, um, to come in at a higher level in the industry, 
Um, you are either going to want to have a master's with very many experiences under your belt, or you're going to want to have a PhD. Um, I was the overachiever and triple majored in undergrad in history, uh, anthropology, and classics. I set, had my mindset to do Roman archaeology. Um, and then tried to learn Latin and Greek and failed at it miserably and decided the prehistoric stuff sounded great. Um, <laughs> but I got my MA and PhD at SUNY Binghamton, um, worked on a dissertation project in Turkey, uh, did the field school right after undergrad in Jordan, um, knew I wanted to work in the Middle East, and so kind of did that until 2017 when I moved to Peru. Uh, but for basically, and then all the other kinds of um, certificates and things like online instruction certificates, uh, GIS certificates, um, those kinds of little classes that you pick up and skills along the way, um, those kinds of things do uh, lots of section work and things like that um, to kind of pick up, you know, skills in ceramic analysis or something like that. Uh, but if you want to be a professor at a four-year institution, you need a PhD. Um, it's a competitive job market, and to set yourself apart with that, you're going to need it, unless you have extremely specialized experiences in a master's. Um, you're going to need that PhD. You can teach with a master's at a community college, or you can work as an adjunct if you're all but dissertation, that is, you've taken your coursework and proven yourself um, that you're capable, but you haven't quite finished that PhD, which is what I did for a couple of years to support myself while I did. Um, but typically, if you want to be a professor, you're going to need a PhD. Okay. So you already talked about your jobs and your backgrounds. We're going to skip back forward to where I tried to advance us. Um, so what does a normal day look like in your current position? Do you do field work? Do you do lab work? Are you writing reports? Are you making phone calls? Are you sending emails? Am I just giving you the whole list of all the things you do? <laughs> so we'll start with Mel. I only do one thing. I email <laughs> all day. Actually, I don't make phone calls, but I take phone calls. So I... Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, let me back up. Um, every it turns out, I found out to my dismay that every state archaeologist does something completely different. None of us have the same responsibilities in each of our states, so we can't even get together and be like, "Hey, how do you do this the best?" Because we all do different jobs. Um, so, but my since my job is. Um, not in the government, so it's I I don't it's not regulatory, so I don't have any responsibilities to make calls like make calls yes or no, not calls on the phone. But I don't have to do any. I can I can just basically sit back and watch it all unfold in front of my eyes, which is fun. Um, but I I basically field emails uh, and phone calls all day long, whether it be from. Uh, folks uh, in in the industry, not not in the CRM industry, just general archaeologists or um, citizens from around the state and sometimes other states uh, that call or email asking about any array of things, whether it be the aliens that built this pyramid on the Conway in Conway with our what? I love the actually the Egyptian questions because I'm like, oh, oh, I can answer this. You know? <laughs> uh, but you know, basically, I just basically communicate all day long with any number of people, stakeholders that um, are interested in archaeology for one reason or another. Emails. Emails all day. Yep. The better you get, the better you get at being an archaeologist, the less you get to go work in the field. You'll, you'll see a pattern. Um, so yeah, my, like every day, for me, every day is different. Um, I work remotely for an office in Portland, Oregon. Um, so like I live, you know, I sit here in Arkansas, but my, you know, the office that I report to is in Portland. Um, I'm only in the field like 5% of the year, I would say. Um, oh my gosh, every day is so different. I could be like writing reports. I could be fixing up reports and making them better. I could be doing business development, like talking to clients. I could be writing proposals to bid on a project that we really wanna get from a client. Um, sometimes I'm teaching our field staff um, things to, to make them better archeologists, like using the technical knowledge that I have and passing that on um, so that people can do better work in the field. Um, I take a lot of phone calls. I'm in a lot of meetings every day. Um, sometimes, um, sometimes I participate or facilitate, um, 
consultation meetings with descendant groups or um, indigenous groups, tribes um, that are um, interested in the project that we're working on. Um, yeah, yeah, well, that was a lot. So I could think of more, but I should stop. Uh, if, if you're hoping that as a professor you get to dig more, I'm sorry. Um, my day-to-day -day is lecture prep and grading. It is um, teaching laboratory classes, hands-on experiences. Um, it's writing publications and grants. Um, it's doing research that I can do. Um, one of the great things about a, being a professor is it lets me do archaeology where I want to do it. And in this case, it's South America. So I, I have the kind of ability to take a step back and prepare over the course of a year for a project. So this, uh, this summer for the month of June, I'll be in Bolivia. Um, but that is the only field work I do the entire year. It's going to be three weeks, maybe four weeks max. Um, and the average field tech will probably do more actual digging in a week than I do in the entire year. Um, so if you're looking for that kind of idea, it's really two separate seasons. Summer is research season. As a professor, you might be able to squeeze in something over winter break. Uh, but for the most part, it's the day-to-day -day things of inter interacting with your students and teaching them how to go live their dreams in archaeology. That's, that's exciting in its own right. I'm going to continue that trend of doing almost no field work because I'm not technically an archaeologist, so I don't get to go on digs or excavations. I get to watch other people do them and have their reports on my desk and then be very jealous. Uh, sometimes, maybe, hopefully, I will get to do the training dig or something that's mm -hmm. happening mm -hmm. in summer mm -hmm. if I can move my way onto that. But for me, most of my job, I would say about probably 75% is sitting at my desk at the office, editing nominations for the register, writing my own nominations for the register, fielding calls from constituents who are asking questions about the register in various degrees of accuracy, and receiving questions about tax credits that have nothing to do with my job whatsoever, but oh, it gets forwarded to me anyway. Uh, and email, yes, the better you can email someone and not have them be mad at you when you email them back, that'd be great. So email etiquette, very, very important. I want to that is so important. Add that to like top of your list of skills, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Email etiquette. Okay, moving on to the next question and just kind of thinking about um, your jobs more so um, on a, I guess, earlier trajectory. Um, how did you apply for the job that you have and where are the jobs, job openings listed um, for your organization? And then uh, to be fully transparent, what is the salary range uh, that you can expect in your current position? Oh, where are we in, where are oh, we in the draft? Yeah. Um, okay, so I, for my position, I was recruited um, by someone who was already working for the company who had worked with me in the past. This is important for you to remember because it will come back in a few questions. Um, your relationships are really important. So I was recruited, um, I advanced pretty quickly because someone else who also worked for the same company found out that I got hired and said, oh, like we want her in this office because she can really help grow our office. And then I, you know, advanced that way. Um, so I was recruited for both of, both of those positions. Um, but if, we do have positions listed on our website, swca.com. Um, we are a firm that um, believes in salary transparency. So when you go on our website and you're looking through jobs and you're interested in like just generally salary ranges for different positions in the industry, that's a good place to go even if you like, aren't ready to apply because it'll show you the expected range. You know, and like take it with a grain of salt based on like cost of living, like where you live in Arkansas is gonna be different than you know the Bay Area, California. Um, but the salary ranges are listed there for like an extra, like, you know, piece of information. And then um, as far as like salary ranges, like, you can expect in the industry, entry level positions, if you have a BA and no experience, like you might only have a field school, you can expect 20 to 21 hour dollars an hour um, with usually with overtime. So that comes out to like, what, like, 40, like 45, maybe 50 a year if you're, if you're pulling in some good overtime. Um, if you have an MA and you're entering with minimal industry experience, um, you'd probably come on at like $24, $25 an hour or like 50 to 55 um, for your salary. Um, and that 
which sounds low. You're like, okay, well, you told me to get a master's and I would like come in at a higher level. But if you have a master's, you advance quicker. Um, entry level with a PhD, which would mean you would be a, um, a principal investigator on projects. You would come in much higher around 65 to 95 uh, in the industry. And there is no minimal experience because if you have a PhD, you just would have a lot of experience. It takes a long time, you guys. It takes a long time. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you can reach, you can, you know, I guess the point is you can, um, you're spending time either way, getting experience or a degree um, to, to come in and like, advance it and get to higher hourly wages or, or salary. Right. So I, I actually did the research on this today, so I was excited. Um, <laughs> you apply for jobs and academic positions are typically posted on national job boards, things like the Chronicle of Higher Education, um, higher ed jobs, but you can also find them if you're looking locally on local colleges, like Lyon posts their jobs, online college website, on the Lyon College website, so you can find, if there's an opening, you can apply for that that way, if you want to kind of take the, the, mac the micro view, but macro, right, you've got Chronicle of Higher Education is probably the standard. But there are other kind of boards, the uh, AAA Net, uh, American Anthropology Association, right? They have their job posting board for uh, academic positions. Um, and then it kind of varies on the job you do. Um, as an adjunct, you can typically expect anywhere between uh, $2,500 to $6,000 course. Um, and I give you these ranges, and that's really based on uh, where you're at, part of the country, cost of living. Um, Stanford's going to give you a little bit more per course than, say, UACCB. Um, so you have that kind of 2500 to about $6,000 course. Um, as a full-time lecturer, that is not on the tenure track, but you're a full-time instructor, um, you can expect somewhere between thirty-five and fifty k a year. Um, and then as a tenure track professor, the, the range starts, on the low end, I was shocked at this, $40,000 a year to $90,000 a year uh, nationwide. Um, and then once you kind of work your way up, um, you get tenure, and then you work your way to full professor, the ranges are 70 to 140 K in anthropology. Um, so there is that kind of possibility of topping out in what you might consider comfortable money. Uh, but if you're interested in being an archeologist and a professor of archeology, span you are not doing this for the money. Um, so we'll kind of keep that in mind. So each state will have its own state historic preservation office and they will all post jobs for national register or section 106 on their own websites those are great places to look the other place that is centralized for more cultural resource than archaeology specific is preserve net it is fantastic it has job openings all the time it has internships on there as well that are done by the national park service or through like the american conservation corps and those are fantastic they will even do trade internships so if you're looking at historic woodworking or window fixing glazing um, more of the trades uh, pathway that is a great place to look and each state is going to have a different salary range um, but because they're state pay, you can look them up online because they have to be transparent. Arkansas, the low end of the salary starts at 37,000 a year and will top up about 60,000. And that is for the people who are managers and supervisors. Um, I can tell you I'm at the low end of that scale at the moment. So yeah, you do not go into these jobs for money. You go into it because you want to do something that you enjoy every day and not sit in a cubicle, even though I do sit in a cubicle quite a bit of time. <laughs> Jokes I, on us. <laughs> you still get to go on survey trips, though. It's, like, it's better. It's good. Uh, as far as working for the Arkansas Archaeological Survey, uh, we post our jobs at archaeology.uark.edu, or just look up Arkansas Archaeology, and you usually find our website. So that's where um, the survey job uh, openings are. Um, and uh, uh, I, I wanted to I wanted to back up real quick because I was thinking about other places that people find jobs, and I did want to mention that the um, the CRM jobs, the basic CRM jobs, you can look at um, shovel bumps. Uh, so look up shovel bumps for you know because you're not going to be applying for our jobs right this minute as you get out of, out of as you get out of school. So. Uh, do look for that, but then you know there there's their jobs get posted kind of everywhere. As far as the state archaeologist jobs, well, there's only fifty six of us, 
because we have uh, Guam, Puerto Rico, I have state archaeologists as well. Anyway, so there are very few of us um, at any given time, and we just pass um, word back and forth to each other. So, um, yeah, I don't know, just ask a state archaeologist if you want to be a state archaeologist and we can tell you whose jobs are open right now. Uh, again, yeah, very few and far between, but like everybody else has been mentioning, um, because it's different from state to state and the state archaeologists are positioned in different parts of the state, whether it be um, at, you know, positioned at the university, there are other folks positioned in state governments, some are in state museums. Um, I, I honestly don't know what the range is, but I would think um, 60 to all the way up to, I don't know. It sounds like an important job, so probably people get upwards of 100 to something that, I don't know. <laughs> I'm pretty useless, I'm sorry, uh, as far as that goes, because there's, like I said, we're in so many different places. Oh, yeah, and also, the, um, there's there's no one here that's, like, representing a federal archaeologist, but that's a whole nother yeah. field, like, park service, like work, you know, anything like government, forest service, forest service um, and those jobs will be listed on, is it USA job? Yeah. yeah. USA jobs. And you can see the salary ranges there based yes. on your entry level. So if you're GS09, you're going to have a uh, range that basically is with your bachelor's degree, right? Versus if you have a higher education, PhD, GS13, right? And that'll give you your salary range based on your qualifications. And those are set from the federal government. So yeah. there's no negotiating your salary there. It's just kind of what it's going to be. And just like FYI, the, the, he's like, you're like GS what? GS like nine, GS 10, GS 11. Those are different grades according to the, the federal government of, of like your expertise, like level. Uh, continuing on the uh, hiring and application track, um, if you guys can speak to um, some skills, experiences, or classes that kind of make an application stand out in the hiring process. So we'll start with Jason. Um, first, uh, I've got some general things. Um, you need to have a passion for the past. Right? If you don't love archaeology, you don't love the past, you don't love historic preservation um, in any way, shape, or form, then this is not a career for you. Um, you need to be motivated, and this is self-motivated. Um, and this was the hardest part of my dissertation, was finding that um, self-motivation to get over the hump and actually start editing the thing once I got the comments back, because that was it's the most deflating moment of my life was getting comments back from my advisors um, on my dissertation. So you need that kind of motivation to keep driving because no one's going to push you for this, right? You're getting that higher level degree or your master's, your PhD, right? Hopefully your advisor is there, but they have a job to do too to make sure you can do the work. And so they can only really be so supportive. I mean, you can't draw the motivation. You're going to have, you're going to struggle with that. Um, and you need to make it personalized, right? Whatever you study has to mean something to you. Um, in some way. Now, as a professor, it really varies based on the institution you work at because the skills you need for um, a research one institution like the University of Fayetteville are not the skills you need to succeed in a college, a small war art school like mine, or at a community college or wherever you end up working. So you need to be able to tailor those schools um, here. So for an R, for a research one that's high level, right, it's implied research is the priority. So you're going to need to have a good research program. You're going to need success in grant writing and grant acquisition. Um, you're going to have to be the right curricular fit. That is, your research dovetails nicely with what they already do. So you can't just say, hey, I want to come in and study, you know, ancient Egyptian uh, burial practices. And there's no one, nothing, anybody at the institution that does that. They're going to say, well, you're not really the right fit for us. And then you need to have at least show some level of teaching effectiveness, not necessarily have teaching experience, but be able to stand in front of the classroom and actually look like you know what you're doing. Um, at Lyon, it's completely opposite. Uh, here in a small liberal arts school like this, you need to be an effective teacher. You need to be able to show students that you care, that you can connect with them, and you can effectively carry that out. Um, you need to have some measure of cross-disciplinary uh, uh, things because in a small school, you're going to wear a lot of hats. Um, I've been very fortunate to do that here. I co-taught classes in arts and religion and hopefully next semester in biology. We're working on that. Um, and you need to have uh, be an effective mentor because you're going to work with students directly on a very personal level that you may not so in a research lab where you have TAs and RAs and GAs who can basically handle the day-to-day -day stuff for you. So it's kind of figuring out what you want to do, where you want to fit. Do you want to be the, the research gung-ho and find the bestest and coolest stuff in the world? 
Um, well, that's going to take a lot of money and applications and time. And so you're going to have to be an effective administrator in R1 to do that. Um, or do you want to teach? And that's where you really find the school that fits you. So in most state historic preservation offices, I would say we get to cross pollinate quite a lot. I get to talk with the people who are in section 106 on a daily basis. I get to go talk with the tax credit people. I get to go talk with people who are working with Main Street communities, working on business solutions for historic downtowns. So it really helps to have a breadth of experience. You don't necessarily need to be a niche <coughs> subject matter expert in one or two of these things, because you're probably gonna be talking with people who have more experience than you in the same office, but you all get to collaborate on the same thing. Uh, so as long as you have some knowledge and are able to accurately articulate that, if you're going for the job in an inter interview. When I got this job, I, I did not have any architectural experience. I learned on the job, but I was very upfront with that when I interviewed for the job and they said, okay, cool, we'll take you anyways, you have archeology span experience. Um, I would say it's heavily useful to drum up your writing skills it is so important to be able to make a coherent argument in writing, to be able to back up your research, to be able to cite things properly in an academic way, because that is going to be scrutinized heavily by other people. And these are documents, at least in my job, that are going into the Library of Congress and will be there for years and years and years. So you need to have writing experience that is good enough, essentially to be in the Library of Congress for the next like 20, 50 years or something like that. Um, I would also say that archaeology in general will make you stand out in a historic preservation office, at least for National Register. I can count maybe three or four other people in my job, in my same position in the entire country that have archaeology background. Almost everyone is an architectural specialist. So just having an, ar an archaeology background and being able to articulate, hey, these are how excavations are done, this is how we should write this nomination, it's a little bit backwards than what the normal historian would be looking at. So that alone would be really helpful for you to say, hey, I know normally archaeologists don't go into this position, but this is a valuable tool and skill that we have in the first place. I'm going to go back to the beginning of what Megan said about breadth of experience. Um, I, I think it's just really, in archaeology, I think it's really, really important to have worked in as many possible jobs as you can, or work taken as many different kinds of classes. Um, Jason mentioned certificates earlier. Uh, just getting, basically, like, I know a lot of people say, like, what's your, what are you, what's your concentration going to be, or what, uh, you know, what do you want to do exactly when you grow up, or whatever. But really, it's it's kind of like dabbling in all the different kinds of jobs that archaeologists have, um, whether it be you know being out in the field and having specific jobs, or being a generalist, and then also working in the lab, working in museums. So like any kind of experience you can get in historic preservation, um, whether it be museums or archaeology or uh, their their whole historic you know preservation programs. But that kind of stuff, um, I think it's really important. That's what makes a, a, an application stand out is that you've gotten as many, you know, just varied experiences. And, and also it'll show that you can function in a lot of different situations, whether it be um, out on the field or with a team. Uh, when you're in the lab, you're kind of with a team, but oftentimes you're sitting in total silence for eight hours a day. Uh, and that, you know, if you can if you can prove that you can deal with all those different kinds of uh, situations and, and work environments, it makes someone more, um, uh, more marketable. I would agree with everything that everyone oh, has good. said. I'm glad we're out of fight here. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, like those are all like wonderful, great tip top tips. Um, if there's something else, if there's something different that I can offer, it would be um, when we're looking over resumes or in our field, you'll hear them called CVs, um, like curriculum vita vitas. Um, if someone has, you know, and, and they're coming in at, at like an entry level, okay, they might've only had a field school, maybe they didn't have a, a whole lot of time to have a whole lot of experience, that's still okay. Um, 
I get really excited when I see that someone has a basic soils class and lab that they've taken. Um, if they have zooarchaeology or an oste a human osteology class under their belt. Um, if they have like maybe had a geology minor and learned how to um, how to process GPR data, which is like a non-invasive survey technique. Um, anything that's that's kind of like specialized, but that is still accessible to you as undergrads is super great because guess what? Even though we're all archaeologists here, all of the different like um, grab bag of specialties that we have all like, you know, collectively like amassed for ourselves. Well, like we are still missing things. So like Mel is the person I text when I'm like, hey Mel, uh, what, what, what is this bone? Is? What bone is this? <laughs> because I, that's not my specialty. And Mel might, might be like, uh, Angela, like what is this, like, rock. what is this rock? You know, what is it made on? Um, so any, any sort of, I don't want you guys to feel like um, none of like these skills are not accessible because they are. Like, you have choices that you can make now to make your resumes, to make your CVs stand out and look good. Also, really, really need you guys incorporate those writing edits. I know you hate it. We hate it. We don't yeah. like it either. It crushes our soul too. But you guys, I spend so much time <laughs> correcting writing um, a lot, so much of my time. Um, so. The, the quicker, like, just, you know, eat the frog, as they say, and just do it, and um, it's a skill that you can learn that's really important. So for all of you guys with your varied experience and amount of time in the field, um, what guidance would you be able to provide to young professionals starting out in their careers besides doing the edits that they want to do? I'm going to start with Megan. <laughs> What experience? I was I was in your shoes not a year and a half ago. Um, my advice would be to cast your net fairly wide. You might not want to be section 106 at the very beginning of your career. But heck, it's going to get you in and you're going to know people. Let me tell you, these states are very, very small in the amount of people that do what we do. We know people. So if you get into section 106 and you go, oh, I don't really like it, let me stay here a couple of years, you're gonna meet people, you're gonna know people, a job will open up and maybe in the same office and you go, ah, huh, wonderful, can I apply for this? And you'll know everyone there and go, yes, we would love for you to be in this job. So just cast your net and why. You might not want to do what you're doing for the first couple of years, but as they say, eat the frog. I've never heard that phrase before, but I'm gonna take it. So, and just, you know, Enjoy it for what it is and what you can do and always look towards what you can do next. Yeah, I, I mean, like I said, you stole my answer as far as uh, just going for it and trying out different things. I don't know if this is necessarily the young professional part, but um, when I was doing stuff, I, you know, I always said I wanted to just do ancient Egyptian bones, but then like, oh, do you want to go on a shipwreck excavation this summer? Yes, yes, I would. <laughs> right. So, I mean, it wasn't the, necessarily a job, but I was working on a project. And so, I, you know, taking just every single experience that pops up to you that you can, you know, within reason, I know there's lots of limitations for lots of different reasons. Um, but just, yeah, doing doing all the different jobs. And like Megan said, you're ne you, you aren't necessarily going to be stuck. Um, doing that particular job, but you'll meet people and be able to do the hey, this is how you got your you got recruited for your jobs. So if you can build a good network of folks um, for as far and wide as you want to. So like my network, you know, goes across the world. Um, not that I actually wound up working in Egyptology, but I probably I might could have because I had enough connections all around that I could have gone somewhere else. Um, and continue to, to be an Egyptologist. So yeah, just being really flexible, as flexible as you can be, like I said, within reason for your own personal things. Yeah. Well, Mel, like, Mel, like halfway stole my answer. Um, I'm gonna, <laughs> um, I, the first thing I wanna say is that your relationships that you build with people when you're getting these experiences, they're so important, you guys. Um, Archaeology is a really small world. We all up here, um, if we didn't, like, okay, Jason and I just met in person tonight, 
Um, we are we are like one degree separated. Um, we have like what two or three people that we both know in common. We all talk to each other. If you apply to come work with me, or if you apply to come, you know, to work with Jason, Jason's gonna call me and be like, "Hey, uh, I know this, you know, um, this person, you know, the student from Arkansas uh, was in your husband Joshua's class. Do you know this student? What can you tell me, Angela, about this student?" And I'll and I'll be able to say like, "This student was great. Um, they were really teachable." Um, if they were really open to the feedback that Josh had to offer, um, or like, oh, Josh took this person out in the field and they were like a real stinker, like don't hire that person. <laughs> that's like, that's what happens Josh behind the scenes. There's no, Josh would ne never say that. He would that. never say that. Um, <laughs> but you guys, like this is what happens with most jobs. Um, there's no CV or resume, like, uh, like series of TikToks that you can watch to A, cover up for the fact that you know, your experience is what it is, and B, um, cover up maybe like, uh, cover up your like relationship skills, work ethic, that kind of thing. So that's like really, really important. Um, the second thing I wanna say is if you guys are picking your classes now, if you're like, or if you're like at the end of undergrad and you're like, oh, like, oh, an MA sounds really intimidating. Don't be scared um, because you think something might be hard. Don't be intimidated by what you think in your mind you might not be good at. Um, I ended up doing I ended up doing a dissertation that incorporated multivariate statistics and geochemistry. If you would have told a uh, 19 year old Angela that she would have been, that she would have done that, she would have been like, "You are you are Delulu. You're cray cray banana. Like I can. There's no way in the world I can learn multivariate statistics. But I'm telling you, you guys are smarter." than you think you are, and the secret is persistence. It's not being perfect or not being a math person or like whatever you're thinking about in your head. So don't be intimidated. Don't not take a class because you're afraid it's gonna be hard. Just do it. So my guidance is basically on my now 10 years of experience as an advisor, sending people into the career, and it's the first thing you need to know is what you actually wanna do, right? Because you need to be able to tailor that. And that's a hard question to ask as a young professional stage, right? But these experiences and the classes and everything else, they cost money. It's a real investment in time and energy. And so make sure that you're choosing wisely in that. So if you think you wanted to go into uh, the private sector to do CRM, right? Know what you need. And that's going to be at the bare minimum BA in a field school. And don't wait until your senior year of college and say, you know what, I, I want to go get a job, but I don't have a field school. And now you've delayed the entire process. So try to get that, kind of understand where you're coming from. Um, figure out what you want to do, how, what fits your personality, and don't be afraid to make it happen, right? And don't be afraid to ask for advice because those relationships that we're building, we're, we're talking about here, right? Those relationships are the people who are going to tell you, be honest with you, tell you, hey, you need to do this, right? And listen to them when they say that. Now, it doesn't mean you have to do it, but it's good advice. And most of us know because we've been there and we're really trying to help. So kind of figure out what your own goals and work within the parameters you have to make that happen. All right, this next one is my favorite question and you guys might, might not like it, but that's okay. I'm asking anyways. Um, is it difficult slash possible to have a work-life balance in your position? Why or why not? Do we'll I get to start? Um, so <laughs> the reason I washed out of academia was because I couldn't have a work-life balance. <laughs> I wanted to go home and work on my garden. Um, and so I couldn't, when I finished the PhD, I could not teach. I was adjunct teaching. Uh, I couldn't teach during the day, class prep, all that stuff, grade, do, you know, like doing all that stuff and then go home and work on trying to publish my dissertation. Just, it just wasn't going to happen. Like. I tried it for a few years and I, I was like, nope. And so I didn't really know what else to do. Uh, so I, that's how I ended up at state parks as a state parks interpreter. And then circled back, I got the job um, that Michelle has now as the education person. Um, and, and that's where uh, 
actually state parks, I still didn't have a work-life balance because I love the job so much that I was literally going out and collecting pecans off the ground and processing them at night and then going and feeding people them the next day. So it, there was no balance whatsoever because I lived on site and it was so much fun. Uh, but then with the education job, um, it, 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 it's not, we, we're not required to publish. We're not required to prove that we can do research. We just get to go home and work on our gardens um, and, and hang out. So I, I have a, a work-life balance now, although I still have nightmares every night about work. So it's like a work-life balance while I'm awake, but while I'm asleep, I'm still working and, and having horrific nightmares about work because <laughs> I'm stressed out at work. And then I go home and work on my garden and then I'm not stressed, but then I go to sleep and I'm stressed. <laughs> so I shouldn't sleep, is that what we're saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was like some honest pathology. Sorry. <laughs> I just wanna like, like witness, like thank you. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, okay, I guess I first want to say, you are the person who you are no matter what job you work. If you have workaholic tendencies, you're going to have that in whatever job you're at. If you have not workaholic tendencies, you're going to, like, maybe want to try to work on that before you have any. <laughs> um, so, so, like, there's that. I have workaholic tendencies, old habits die hard from grad school. Um, when I took when I took the job that I have now, I was like, great, work life balance. And then I decided it would be cool to spend every weekend for the first nine months trying to publish my dissertation articles, which is insane. Um, zero out of 10, do not recommend. Um, now, um, I would say that my work life balance is a lot better. Some weeks are stressful. Some weeks I'm under a lot of deadlines and I have, you know, we want to get stuff. I need to get a wrap up a project quick so that I can get it back to a client. They're happy. They keep hiring me. I still have a job. Um, so there's some weeks where I'm busy. I might put in 50 hours instead of 40. Um, if, um, if I cruise out in the field and they're in a really remote location, like a rural Alaskan village and they call me, it's Sunday, I might be in a, you know, watching a movie with my husband. I'm still going to pick up the phone because my crews might need me in that situation. They might need me to show up for them to get something done for them. Am I on call 24 seven? Like, um, you know, like a hospitalist, like, no, I do not like wait for my phone to ring 24 seven. So I would say that like my, it is possible to have work-life, it is possible to have work-life balance, but it is a little bit more involved than, you know, clocking in, clocking out, like if you worked at a, you know, like a retail job or something like that. Uh, my answer was, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, the, as a professor, you have hectic moments in the semester. Um, the start of the semester, the end of the semester and midterms, those are the times when I find myself at home doing a lot um, that I can't necessarily get done at the office. So I'll be grading papers until eight or nine o'clock at night or something along those lines. Um, but the benefits of academia is I have a flexible schedule. Um, I get to set my hours. I get to kind of carve out time. Right now this semester, I have Monday, Wednesday, or Monday Friday afternoons off and Tuesday, Thursday mornings off. But you know, most of that time I'm also doing lecture prep and grading during that time. But it's time that I've got some flexibility that I can go and schedule a doctor's um, take my daughter out of class to take her to her doctor's appointment or something along those lines. Um, so it's given me a little bit of flexibility there that I didn't have when I worked for CRM in the private sector, didn't have working logistics at UPS, didn't have in other jobs that I've had. Um, I also get large breaks, um, get winters and summers off, uh, but summer is research time, so that's a whole host of other problems. And when you work in a foreign country, um, that is, there's no break. It is you're there, I'm in Bolivia from the 1st of June until the 22nd or so, and it is 14, 15 hour days trying to get everything I need to do get done in Bolivia because, well, it's in Bolivia and I'm not. And so I gotta get done what I gotta get done. So there's there's some balance there when you're in the field, but um, for the most part, you know, it's it depends on the personality, I think, but I, I actually think I have more balance now um, than, I, than I did before I got the tenure track job. I think that's the uh, I might have the best work-life balance out of everybody on this on this <laughs> panel at the moment. That is the cushy benefit of working for the state is we have time that we accrue every single month. So you have federal holidays, you have state holidays sometimes. Uh, you don't have Juneteenth, which is very strange to me. But 
you accrue those days and you can use them when you want. Now, there are times when there are deadlines due and you work until those deadlines are met. There are times when you have to process an entire historic district, which is upwards of 50 pages in about two days. Those can be very stressful times, but they are not all the time. It's maybe about three times a year where those deadlines, at least in my job, are, are due. Uh, for the rest of it, it's it's pretty good, you know? Eight to four, good time. You get to go home. You don't get to stress about emails, although sometimes there are projects that you just go home and you just think about them because they're frustrating. <laughs> but that's going to happen with any job that you take. There's always going to be that project. Um, and then rounding out uh, kind of the recorded um, questions that we have for you guys, and then we'll open it up to Q&A after these last two. Um, what is the, uh, your favorite thing about your job? And we'll start with Angela. Um, my favorite thing about my job is I get to do something different every day. If I get bored with something, there's always something like new and shiny that I can that I can work on when I like am so tired of looking at whatever project I'm looking on. Um, every single day is different and that's really engaging to me. Um, Doing the same thing every day over and over and over is um, that's something that some people really want their days to look like. That does not work for me. Um, I, I'm constantly feeling engaged every single day at my job, um, and there's always something new for me to learn at my job. Um, and, and also, like, I feel, you know, like, um, cultural resource management if you if you are an ethical archaeologist, if you do it well, you can be a real driving force for good, you know, for protecting things that are precious to people, for helping infrastructure that really needs to get built, get built. Um, so, you know, there's there's things like that that I enjoy in my job as well. Uh, I wouldn't be here as a professor if I wasn't interested in student interaction. Interacting with my students on a day-to-day -day basis is the best part of my job. Uh, the fact that I get to teach them archaeology is even better. Uh, but seeing students make the connections between the past and the present, or connecting them with a skill or a resource, or even just um, teaching forensic anthropology this semester, seeing them kind of, we're talking about the bones and seeing them kind of like feel on their bodies and they're finally getting a connection that, that you know, the humorous and you got the, the electron fossa and there's the Ola and they're kind of, that's, that has made my semester. It's been really fun. So it, teaching is uh, probably my second passion and it's really great that they dovetail well together. I'm going to piggyback off of both of those because I get to do a little bit of both. Maybe not teaching in, the, in front of a student body, but when people call us and say, hey, we have this old building in Brinkley or something. We really want to save it, but there are certain things we have to do in order to make it livable. You know, no one wants a building with no roof, for example. A little bit of a problem. Getting to help them and advise them about how best to save a resource so that it's not going to be demoed is a great feeling when they come back to you with a project in a couple of years and go, hey, look what we've done. We've saved it. It's still there. Might not be all there, but it's mostly there, and you've done something. And you've also helped build community spirit in a way that I don't think a lot of other jobs get to get to do. You get to foster that sense of pride. You get to help them feel a little bit better about where they've come from in their community. And I think that's a, a really special thing that you get to do. Um, I'm going to steal both of their answers. No, all three answers. So uh, I, I sort of have two, di two different favorite parts of my job, because one is selfish and the other one is selfish. <laughs> so the first one is the flexibility. I also like new shiny things. So I get to, um, if I feel like I'm failing, you know, you get tired of stuff. I just feel like I'm failing at stuff. So when I feel like I'm failing at one thing, I try to go fail at another thing. And so I, I get to, I, um, I, uh, I, I get to choose my own projects and what, what I want to do basically. So I, I really like that, that I got, have the flexibility to, to do what I want most of the time. Um, but then the other favorite thing, again, is sort of selfish only because I really enjoy talking to different kinds of people all day long. And I really like, you know, Megan likes to help folks 
I like to help folks. Um, I often call myself the archaeological operator, like telephone operator, um, because somebody will call me and be like, I don't know what to do about this. And I'll be like, I don't know either, but here's so-and-so's name from the blah, blah, blah. So I, I basically connect people a lot of, a lot of days. Um, some people curse me for that because then they get the call and they're like, why did you tell that, that, um, that Egyptian pyramid guy in the Conway? I don't, I don't, I try not to pass those ones on, but basically I really do like to, um, help people, um, in a, in a much more basic way, uh, by, by basically connecting people and helping people. I, I like, and it's, and the reason that it's, uh, uh, selfish is because I like to have a lot of friends. So I like to be able to be like, oh, they're my friend. I can tell them that they're my friend, and then I can make you can make friends with that person too. Friends <laughs> like that too. Friends, yeah. Friends that was beautiful. Start <laughs> um, killing it tonight, y'all. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so moving on to our last uh, question. On the flip side, what is your least favorite thing about your job? And we'll start with Casey. Um, my least favorite thing is hands down grading. Oh. Um, I just. That's that's a philosophical debate. I'll say for a different venue, but grading is probably my least favorite thing about this. And then the second would be that I don't get to do a lot of field work. I, I miss being in the field, um, but I'm working on changing it. So, uh, on the flip side of having new shiny things all the time, I don't get to pick the new shiny things that come across my desk. So if there is a mid-century modern hotel that comes across my desk that is eligible for the National Register, doesn't matter what I feel about mid-century modern, I'm working on that nomination anyways. Uh, so yeah, probably my least favorite is I don't get to not do mid-century modern. <laughs> <laughs> I hope my boss doesn't see that because he loves mid-century modern. Sorry, Ralph. <laughs> And as the second time, Ralph has come up tonight in the con in the conversation of Midmod. So yes. I think you really hate Midmod. I do not enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the same. It all looks the same. It's all concrete. <laughs> Sorry, Ralph. Sorry, Ralph. Uh, the least favorite thing about my job. Do you remember the um, Egyptian pyramid guy in Conway? <laughs> uh, we um, hard conversations is the least my least favorite thing about my job. Whether it be why can't I sell this skull in this flea market, or um, or a more like reasonable <laughs> hard question like should I put this building on top of this thing or something like that. So it's. Um, I, there's a lot of ethical um, things that come up that are just really difficult and heartbreaking in my job. I get a lot of folks call and say, you know, I, I live on this property and next to this, you know, next to my, they're plowing the field and there's a mound and it's getting plowed down and what can you do about it? And I say, oh, there's nothing I can do about it. Like for various reasons, there's nothing I can do about it, but there's also nothing anyone can do about it. So I see, um, I see a lot of, as, as I'm sure most of us do, I see a lot of destruction, um, whether it be un, uh, misunderstood, like a lot of people just don't realize that how much can be still under the ground intact, but then even worse is when, the, when it's knowingly uh, uh, looting and stuff that I have to um, either maybe mention to people and try to get them to stop that mentality, um, so those kinds of hard conversations as far as like, no, what you're doing is actually uneth unethical. Well, why? It's just a skull. No, no, I, it, it's so much deeper than that. <laughs> so that's a hard thing to get somebody on the same level as, as us um, in, in ethics and stuff like that. Hard. Yeah, I would have to agree. I would have to agree with Mel. Um, hard conversations is hard. And in compliance work, you have a lot of hard conversations, things get really spicy all the time, um, whether it's your clients who don't like, um, who don't like that there are laws <laughs> that you have to follow, or, um, or whether there's two stakeholders um, that are commenting on a project we're doing and the stakeholders want to do different things um, and don't agree with each other. Um, you know, like I, I'm a neutral party. My job is, is to protect the resources. 
but I also have to facilitate these conversations. Like that's my job. Um, so that can be, that can be hard. I, I think one thing that I want to let you guys know uh, involving like the day to day of like what you do when you work uh, for a private company in the industry that you might not know. Um, so you heard me say that we do client work. That means that our app, our hours are billable, like kind of like a lawyer's would be. So you know how I like touch a lot of stuff in the day, a lot of projects. I have to be really good at writing down <laughs> to the 15 minutes how many hours I spend on each project, um, which is like not like my natural tendency. Like I kind of tend to get in a flow and just like go and then come up for air like six hours later. I've had to stop that <laughs> because we I I have to bill my clients for my out like for my hours. So that's something that's been like. It's not like my least favorite thing, but it's something that doesn't come natural to me that I've had to do different in this job that like a lot of, I that I even, you know, like realize would be a huge part of my life. So those are all our normal questions that we put together. Um, so if people in the audience either here or virtually have any questions. I hope we're only at a little over an hour, so I hope that y'all on the panel are okay with answering that. We can talk yeah. more. Yeah. 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 Just we're very more. close. We yeah. need to put those college degrees to use. And the one question I had was I was wondering if you could expand on how the entry level CRM position, positions work in like Arkansas specifically. Uh, from the law talk, it seems a lot more general. I don't know if we could get any more. Say, say that last part again. Uh, during the talk, a lot of the, the kind of CRM description seemed really general. I was wondering if you could expand on Arkansas specifically. You mean like what an entry level job is? Like, or how that how would look one. like in Arkansas? I don't know that it's so. I don't know that it's so different state by like state by state as far. Okay, I'm lying to you. I just thought of like an example. Okay, <laughs> so, there we go. Um, in Arkansas, uh, fortunately, to um, to apply for an entry level position, you just need you need to have a field school and a gung ho great attitude, right? Not like not really so in other states. For example, um, in Oregon, to um, to work in compliance, to be to be a field director, um, like a sort of a, like which would be like one step up entry level. Like one step up, you're full time at a firm, you're getting benefits, um, you're like a crew chief, right? To do that in a state like Oregon, you have our requirements that you have to tell the state about before they stamp you and say, okay, you can go out. And in Oregon, I think it's like, you have to have like the equivalent of like six, six weeks um, doing supervised um, excavation, uh, six six weeks of supervising lab work, um, another chunk of hours spent doing, I think it's something like cur curation. I, I, I don't know. Um, you know <laughs> I'd have to like to look it up. You don't like those 15 minute blocks anyway, so that six days don't, don't work either. Six weeks don't work either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and you have to have basically a master's thesis or a report that you've written that's the equivalent of a master's thesis. Basically, they've made it so that you have to, you have, to have an MA. Um, which is bit, which is like different in that state. Um, in Arkansas, not so. Um, you can go straight into field tech work with a BA and a field school under your belt and minimal experience. Is that like kind of what you wanted to know? You can say no. Yeah, I think so. I was, you could say no. I was kind of thinking about kind of are there any major differences between different regions? And I think that covered it fairly well. I can also add something to CRM stuff. Um, because, because I'm so old, um, I've seen CRM jobs change. Um, used to, uh, you get uh, CRM jobs with small firms, local, you know, close to where you live kind of sometimes. I mean, I was from Fayetteville, so I had access to two or three local firms. Uh, there are only, okay, there is, no, there may be a few. There are very few local firms left. Uh, most CRM jobs are now enveloped into 
larger environmental firms that do various things. So there'll be an archaeology section of um, a lot of the bigger environmental firms, you know, in, as well as the engineers and the biologists and all the other kind of folks that are, you know, have to um, have to check check off boxes. So I think it's nowadays um, not as and that and I'm only really talking about an Arkansas perspective. I'm not sure what's going on in other states. Oh, the but, little guys are still there in other states. The little guys are still there in other states. Yeah, they're underbidding me. Oh. Getting, getting, getting their projects because oh. <laughs> they can do it from their garage. There's like no overhead. Oh. <laughs> well, so I've seen the smaller firms die in Arkansas. <laughs> is um, a sad thing because and here's my I'm getting on my state archaeologist soapbox but it's a sad thing because we have people coming from all over the country doing archaeology in our in the state that don't necessarily have a really good regional understanding of what happened in the state and his you know his, historically so yes you can you can read all the reports you want from a certain area but you're not going to have the eyeballs to be able to to distinguish the Gary point. No, I, I know you can do a Gary point from something else, but the, the, to really distinguish and know, know the nuances of the uh, material culture really well. So we have a lot of folks coming in doing the archaeology that don't have a really good like, and I'm sad about that because I uh, the little firms were at least more regionally um, educated, mm -hmm. not educated, but experienced, I should say. Yeah, Mel is right. So um, over the last 30, over the last like 30, 40 years, there has been a boom and sort of like a boom and bust cycle um, in CRM. Um, when, when, I, when I started grad school in 2011, people were, um, there weren't a whole lot of CRM jobs. People with master's degrees were like duking it out to get temporary seasonal positions. Um, with Biden passing um, the infrastructure bill, work is exploding. Renewable energy development is exploding here in Arkansas. Um, it is super growing, which is why Mel was saying there's like people who like have never worked in the Southeast in their life who are getting flown out, you know, who are getting flown down from Montana, getting flown in from New Mexico, Arizona to come, you know, do these surveys to facilitate this, you know, building this infrastructure. Um, and, and it is a problem because, you know, if you grew up, you know, if you're like used to doing archaeology in the desert Southwest, how do you know what a bulldozed mound looks like? Mm -hmm. um, and Mel's right, like, you can read reports, but how do you know what it looks like on the ground unless you've had that experience? Um, so, so now as like the work is growing, we're like trying to keep our heads above water, trying to keep up with the work. Um, yeah, so that, that is true. Yeah, I guess we're just, um, the, the, like I said, the boxes are getting checked and the reports are getting put in, but the synthesis is not happening. So yeah, you can you could even do the the research and put the time into identifying your artifacts and then giving an interpretation. But nobody's doing a grand interpretation anymore. So the synthesis is not happening. At least, like I said, this is what I'm seeing in Arkansas. I'm not, I don't know. Arkansas. So we can make that argument as a general trend in CRM under yeah. under under reporting results in terms of um, communicating and creating the big picture narratives. But that's not a problem we're going to solve tonight. No, it is a problem that we're talking about, though, and as more um, full disclosure, um, I did not plan to be a CRM archaeologist. I planned on being an academic at like since we're all being honest, the academic job market is it, it is a dumpster fire, as <laughs> Barker says, that emits neither light nor warmth. So <laughs> keep that in mind. It's especially hard when you have a spouse and you guys both work in the same region. Um, so yeah, academics did not work out for me. I have ended up in CRM as more people with PhDs and a lot of experience end up in this field, we are starting to say, okay, um, mutually assured job security is collaboration. We have to start fixing these problems and um, ensure, <laughs> ensuring that all archaeologists have a future <laughs> because if we don't get it together, um, regulators are going to do it for us uh, and, and start relaxing a lot of the standards and laws, and that is bad, bad, bad. Um, so yeah, Jason's definitely right. It is a problem. It is something that we are like talking about in the field about, you know, like what we can do to fix it.
So it's up to you. It's up yeah. to you. <laughs> People to fix up. <laughs> to clean up our messes. I have a question. And I'm not speaking for me and or for her. She can speak for herself, but on behalf of her, I think her main interest is her uh, major is anthropology. And uh, he's one of her instructors, by the way. Thank you. Um, I think she's leaning more toward cultural anthropology. Is there one specific or two foreign languages that would benefit her more than others? Depends on where you are. Yeah. yeah. All over the place, in museums. But like different what, what, like, what cultures you want to focus on, and um, and if you want to study dead cultures, obviously you need to or dead languages, I should say. Then you need to learn your Latin. Um, so, <laughs> so far. yeah, I, I really think. I mean, it really just depends on what, yeah, what yeah I mean, culture you want to look at. The, the beauty of anthropology is you can do it anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also a major problem when it comes to trying to figure out the things that you're interested in. Um, so the, the question is kind of find out what you're interested in and specialize there. Um, so if you need to know, for example, to learn Turkish, uh, I did it miserably, but um, I didn't know I needed to learn Turkish until I started grad school. And at that point, it became obvious. And so when you start to kind of get through where you're going and know what you want to do, that's kind of those first steps and plans, right? It's to, to find the skills that you need to build that, that particular career. And it might be learning um, or do or Turkish or French, wherever it is you go. I learned Russian when I was a graduate student because I was going to do um, a dissertation project in Siberia, which didn't work out because I went to Russia. And I was like, I don't want to come back here again. Um, <laughs> so, um, and so I ended up, yeah, I ended up taking like eight hours of Russian that didn't count towards my degree plan, but it was like just something I did because I was like, okay, well, I guess I just let me to know it. And don't let that intimidate you because you know what? When your plane lands in Russia, you have no choice but to figure some stuff out. Yeah. So don't be intimidated by like, oh, I have to learn this language before I can do it. No, you just have to like learn enough language so you do that so that you can do it. Um, none of us are. Well, you you are pretty much no, fluent in no, Arabic. No, 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 she says no. that she's not, but she's definitely no, conversational. Um, <laughs> wait, let me. I don't know. The other thing I was going to say is cultural anthropology. Okay, so archaeologists love to like wave and be like, this is a problem, someone should fix it, and then like not do anything to fix it, which is like super annoying. One thing we have gotten good at in CRM, yeah, <laughs> uh, one thing that we've gotten better, not good, but better at, is performing ethnographies of places where we should, conducting um, stakeholder interviews, such, such as with indigenous co you know, communities where our projects are near or on their traditional lands. More and more, our projects, are starting to need, I am starting to need to hire cultural anthropologists to go in and do ethnographies because I don't have the time. I also, I mean, I'm a four field trained anthropologist, but my dissertation did not involve um, formal cultural anthropology um, surveys. And there's a whole training that goes in behind doing that. So if you guys are out here being like, oh, look, I really like, you know, cultural anthropology, but like, it seems like there's less, you know, opportunities to get jobs in archeology. span I can tell you that I have been, like there have been weeks where I've been like on the phone calling, you know, all day trying to find someone who I'm like, I'll give you money, here is money. I need mean, like, I really need your help to get this project done. And it's been hard to find because cultural anthropologists have gone through a, a tough time with jobs also, maybe even more so than archeologists lately, but, um, I just wanted to like let you know that like jobs are out there, especially in in the industry. If you decide that you want to do cultural anthropology, for those of you in ethnographic methods, take note of this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, she has to have a foreign language. When she took Spanish in high school for a few years. She wanted to do something different. But it was no longer being those well, I. Sorry. I will add that. So I did my master's degree in the UK. One of the foreign languages that they wanted the most was French, because that is the other language of the UN. So if you were looking to work in Europe, maybe eventually, I don't know if that's something that you're looking at, that could be helpful. They always say English or French, but they always have that, you know, preferred uh, category in front of the French. So maybe that's something that you'd be interested in, as well as the regional language that is more important than the French, I'll be honest, way more important. Yeah, the regional language so you can function in the culture that you're living in. But then also, it turns out that 
sometimes like this is just again my own personal experience but when i worked in egypt the main research languages which means basically the main other like people that are going over to egypt to do the work you're going to find the publications in french and german so sometimes it could help like i took my language in arabic and i did the arabic exam but there are very few Arabic literature. I literally, like my Arabic professor, couldn't even find an archaeology um, thing written in Arabic for me to, to me translate. Better. Huh? That's getting better. Too. I know, but like it was like you know he had to like pull some other random thing for me to translate. But the the but I, I for my dissertation it was very helpful to have um, to have my the literature search be um, widened by my very ridiculously basic um, reading knowledge of French. So I was able to pull some French literature in, not literature, I just mean French written <laughs> research in. So there's lots of reasons to learn different languages for, um, for particular areas that you're gonna work in. And sometimes it turns out that the, the, most the, the most publications on a research topic may not be in English. I would also like to, like to say at this point, you probably can't make a wrong decision. Mm. So just like yeah, take just... the one that you hate the least. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And if you have a background in Spanish, I mean, yeah. that's, you know. Spanish, French, make any other romance language would be easier. Yeah. Easier. Yeah. Like half the list of the world yeah. speaks Spanish. So. Yeah. Okay. Yep. 750 million people or so. Are there any questions on the Zoom call if you want to ask yourself or if you want to type something, something in the chat? I am watching the chat too. Any other ones in the room? Please. Um, I am in Dr. Kennedy's forensics class, and we're all having trouble with identifying features. Was there, is there anything? Why aren't you teaching the features? I am trying to teach the features. He, he is teaching us. We're just having so. trouble. Um, is there anything that helps you with features other than just, because we only, we only really get to spend time with the bones in class or in lab. Mm -hmm. We have to make time outside of class. And so does Dr. Kennedy, uh -huh. if we want to do that. I mean, legally? <laughs> kidding i was just making the joke like okay get you some crock pots <laughs> no um i really do think it's well first of all you're gonna you're gonna pass the course even if you're not gonna like know every single feature right yes okay um no features are really hard because they're gonna look they're all actually often there's a kind of a variation so you they may look different from one individual to another right um, I, I, so I don't really think there is anything except for practice, 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 and seeing multiple, multiple, multiple individuals, which is very hard in an undergraduate class because you only have access to one or two, two study yeah. skeletons, right? So I think it's just really a matter of, um, one thing actually, yes, there's something you can do. And it's not, <laughs> it's not actually a thing that you might not have access to. Something I'm remembering now what allowed me to learn the features. I took a primate anatomy course um, in college where I actually had to dissect a, a primate. And that allowed me to see where the muscles connected to the bones, which made me understand how they moved and made me remember what the features were. And I'll just say now in fairness, sorry, so far, nobody has taken me up on my offer of extra time outside of class or lab. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. I'm technically not actually. Yeah, I know. I'm <laughs> taking the class for credit. I'm taking the class for me. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, like, I need to take a deep breath. <laughs> I have one more tip for you. Um, remember that time when Mel was like, hey, you only have one set of bones to learn on? You only have one set of bones. Ah. So he can only it's ask. It's only ever gonna be the stuff that you looked at. <laughs> That's true. 
That's true. We, I think until next. I think we mentioned that yesterday in class. <laughs> So just, but, just I mean, remember, he's not going to pull out some like <laughs> specimen you've never extra seen. Person. Like, gotcha. <laughs> and all those things are real expensive. Okay. And he's like, yes. But when he sneaks the pig bone in, when he sneaks the non human bone in, then wow. you've got to be ready. It won't so, be pig, but yeah. Huh. <laughs> I mean, sometimes there's non human animals that get thrown into the osteology exam that totally mm -hmm. make you cry. What? I haven't seen this before. <laughs> I've got some deer tipping away here. Uh huh. It's not this oh, oh, deer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll see you in the, in the, at the end of the month. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to come here and do trauma and pathology. Am I? Yeah. That's what you said you wanted okay. to do. Okay. Sure. I'm doing it. Yeah, um, so preface this by saying that I may not have um, a good idea of what it means to be an oncologist, and I may also not have fully understood what y'all were saying, but um I don't know. I think you're holding a right in the rain notebook, yeah. and it yeah. seems like you're yeah. probably farther along than you think. So, so um, you all sort of mentioned that none of you do any sort of digging very often. I know that you, um, the, uh, sorry, you, I, I, I don't know. Angela, Mel, Jason. Yeah, so Jason said that, um, you know, that I believe you, you know, you, you, you go to summer or over the summers you go to Peru and stuff like that. And um and others run teams, but so I guess my question is like when you think of an archaeologist, oftentimes you think of digging in the dirt. So who is digging? Where are the positions that are um doing those things? Are those student positions typically? Like are those map um did, did that question make any sense? Yeah, no, yeah. The, field, the field techs are doing the work. Okay, field yeah, that's the entry level. The entry level position, you get a job as a field tech, and you will do, like I said, more archaeology in a week than I do in a year. Yeah. Um, so that will be the the basic kind of idea, and you kind of work your way up the the rank because you can only dig in the dirt for so long. Yeah. Yeah. Your knees will not thank you. I'm 30, and I stand up, and my knees pop. It's because yeah. of all the kneeling and everything. You cannot stay, unfortunately, as much as I think we would all wish to. You can't stay in the field forever. I see. So the the <laughs> pipeline is like. Field tech to field supervisor. like managers, yeah. supervisors. Yeah. Usually, I will jump in here and say though, um, I have people. I have people in some of the offices where I've worked that are um, <laughs> that are like um, my that are my age, but they're like um, I would like to not advance, please, mm -hmm. and because I want to stay working in the field, like mostly. Um, now, does that mean that they don't get responsibility thrust on them because they're good at their job? No, um, they just don't. They don't take the advance um, and possibly the pay bump that would come with taking that advance in position. Not that they don't accrue raises, they do. But um, just a little bit of insight that that maybe like just to give you. Remember how I was saying that um, my hours are billable. Um, so with more experience, you become more expensive. So um, when we're creating a budget and we're talking to a client, we're saying, hey, this is how much it's gonna cost for you, know, for you to get your project done, hire us um, because we have the expertise. We have to balance cost with time, with jobs. So that means that field tech positions, the majority of people who are gonna be doing like the digging in CRM, they're way cheaper by the hour than I am. So I can't spend very much time in the field. I do um, because, because of my expertise. Um, sometimes I do have to go out and be like, okay, you guys thought that you found a mound out here. Let me come out here and double check and make sure that this is correct because I have more technical experience. But I, can I spend two weeks out there? Absolutely not because I would blow the budget. We would have to charge the clients for my time and they would be very angry. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, so that's, you know, in the, in the industry, that's also kind of a concern is 
um, with increased technical knowledge, you just become more expensive and valuable. And that means that we have to like, you know, you have to minimize your time um, doing things like field work. Now, does that mean that like sometimes I don't get thrown into the field? Nope. Sometimes you need people with advanced technical knowledge to be in the field and it just, it's going to be what it's going to be and it's going to be expensive. You know, it, it just kind of like depends on, on the project and, and where you're at, if that makes a little, if that gives you a little bit more background yeah. to how that works. And, and I think if you ask any, every one of us tomorrow if we want to do a dig, I think the answer would be yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's one of those things, it's the trade-off you make because of the position you've taken. Uh, you kind of put yourself at a, a scale where that's not possible. And so I, I take my students out to dig as much as I can, but it's not something I can do every day. But let's go back to the original statement that you made in that the public tends to think of archaeology as digging. It turns out that the public is sadly misinformed <laughs> because the digging is the very smallest base percentage of what actually happens in archaeology. It's just what appears to or, or what what the media show or the media tells you <laughs> is fun is the digging, but actually, yeah, I mean, it's fun, but there's so many other fun parts of it. Um, it could be the, the thrill of discovering something in the lab um, that you wash off and you see, oh my God, there's actually a transfer print on this piece of ceramic or the thrill of hitting that percentage on those statistical analysis that what is it? 0.0. That's it. No, they are. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's significant. Significant. The P value. Less than 0.05. Something for us. Okay. Anyway, so there's so many other uh, exciting things that TV just won't show because they're not. It's not glossy and dirty and you know sexy. It's too nerdy for television. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And that lab, that lab work is a lot of fun too. Oh, right. Yeah. You get into it, and right. but, you know, kind of thinking the, the way my advisor explained it to me: for every month we dig, spend in the field digging, we have three months in the lab, and because it takes us time to make sense of what we found, and it's irresponsible of us to continue digging. And so yes. I think that what is missing from a lot of that conversation about archaeology, yeah, the digging is great, it's fun, and it's so exciting to get out there and actually find something and make that tangible connection with the past. But we miss out on all the things that the media doesn't care about is just us running through, you know, this, the weight and size and decoration and tempers on the shirts and the types of the stone points and how much debitage we have. And, but all of that matters even more because it tells us the story, right? And so I think that's, we have a disconnect. And we, we as archaeologists have not been very effective at managing that because, well, the digging gets us grant money and attention and all the things that help us keep our jobs. I will also say that because my job is a little more tangentially related to archaeology than anyone else here. For me, archaeology is not necessarily what you do, it's how you think. Can you take the separate facts that have been unearthed from the ground, put them together in a meaningful way to tell a story about the past? If you can do that, then you are a, an archaeologist. And it's a little bit different than history because the facts you're working with are a lithic or a pottery shirt or something like that, which might be a little take a little bit more working than just finding something in the archive. And it is a skill that I think not enough historians appreciate. It is a thought pattern that is very difficult for historians to do because it's almost like working backwards for them is how they've told me about it before when I've been doing nominations with an archaeological event. And, and that thought process and the ability to take all of those facts that to some person just looks like a clod of dirt is incredibly important and not talked about enough and it's not seen in anything that you do, but it is prevalent in any archaeological conference and any nomination that you're going to be doing is that thought process. And it's, a, and it's our ethical duty when we find things in the field, whether or we didn't find things in the field, you know, like we have to remember that they're not my cultural resources. They're not Jason's or Mel's or Megan's uh, nomination. You know, they belong, they belong 
to everyone. And sometimes they belong to specific stakeholders that are really important. Sometimes they don't belong to you at all, but they yeah. belong to the stakeholders. Most of the time, um, time actually, they belong to the certain group of people um, who, who are not you. The point is that they're not mine. <laughs> But you know, when we're when we're like taking things out of the field, we can never replace them. They're a non-renewable resource. So we have to document them. We have to make sure that we've like fully described them the best way that we know how, and then given that information, you know, to the people that need it. And that happens inside these, not <laughs> not outside. Outside these. Outside these. I don't know why I said that. I'm glad this, I'm glad this is recorded in perpetuity. Not nice. forever. Forever. What is the weirdest experience in the field that you guys have? Like one particular incident or moment or situation that just like really uh -huh. like the weird is a large umbrella. Can yeah. you yeah. be more specific? Yeah. I just just one particular experience during a, a field study or something that really impacted you or Getting shot at was not fun. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and the, the, the biggest problem I have is, um, uh, yeah, I, I was in Louisiana. And so, <laughs> um, you know, and it's not all like popular. Um, so, you know, that wasn't fun. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, that's, you know, that's, that's a rare occurrence. Nothing that really surprised you or just completely shocked you. I uh, was, um, Asking for a uh, plumb bob, which is one of the tool that we use um, in the Arabic that I learned, only to find out it was a dialect that was completely unrelated to the Egyptian dialect, and I was actually asking for someone's anatomy part. <laughs> so dialect <laughs> differences can really uh, open your huh. Did you get hanged by his <laughs> No, I got laughed at. I got, I mean, everybody fell apart. The whole entire <laughs> field project, all the Egyptians just lost it. All <laughs> fell apart. Language differences cause a lot of issues. Yeah. Big sites, so. Yeah. I would say that something that's really unique about like my work history is I've, I've done a lot of work. I ended up doing a lot of work in backcountry Alaska where like um, there's no facilities, there's no anything, you get dropped off by a helicopter for six weeks with all of your food, and they say, bye, don't call unless someone's dying, um, and, and we don't. Um, so that's like, that's been like a really formative and like unique experience for me. I want to like also add a disclaimer here. Um, I never did a lick of camping before I went to backcountry Alaska when I became an archeologist. I was not what you would call, like, I wasn't that kid who was like, I love digging in the dirt. No, I like stayed inside and bread. I like to not. <laughs> no, thank you. No, I grew up in a swamp. There's mosquitoes. No, thank you. I didn't like it. Um, so, but- the Mosquitoes are low ice. Well, okay, there are mosquitoes in Alaska, so I did make a mistake. <laughs> but, they, will, they will carry you away. But um, yeah, I became like an out, like an, an outsidey, outdoorsy person, um, because I, I like really Ooh, loved archaeology. Well, I mean, like you. Okay, Mel is. I would say that Mel is truly an outdoors person because she goes. And now um, look, I work indoors <laughs> because oh, she goes camping for fun. The tables have turned. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, yeah. So that's been like unique. Another thing on a more serious note, like Mel might have not included this, but. If you are a woman, it can be hard yes. working in other countries. It can be even hard working oh, in the South. Yes, um, it can be hard working, working in this country. Working in this country, yeah. if you're an archaeologist. So um, being prepared um, for those situations when they happen, not if they happen, they will happen. Um, it can be shocking the first time it happens um, and sad. So just make sure that you have support and you have a plan when you go out in the field. Yeah, I would second that. I worked in the Republic of Georgia for a summer, and that is not a culture that is highly, uh, shall we say, progressive of women's values and, and uh, ability to work outside of the home. So there were quite a few comments that you'd have to kind of field every day. And this was true for any of the women who were working on the field, including the director of the dig, who was a woman. And that was kind of fun for the uh, Georgian men to take directions from her. And they said very not nice things that I shall not repeat. Uh, on the other fun note, 
uh, probably my weirdest experience and most fun experience was I was the smallest person on my excavation in Fort Germana in Virginia. So they were the ones who went, hey, Megan, let's measure this well. <laughs> let's measure your waist and see if you can fit down there. Nice. And I did fit. And then they went first. You don't. Yeah, can you sign this waiver first? <laughs> Uh, why? And then we're, yeah, there's not a lot of uh, technology on that dig. So I, would, I went down the well. There's a great picture of me just like head first. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Good times. Uh, and then also in Georgia, my, uh, my last fun story was the Azerbaijani military decided that they were going to hold exercises over the border. And our dig site was maybe 15 miles away from the border. So we get, we had a Jeep just come up. There were guys with guns in the Jeep. And they were like, you need to get out of here now. And we went, uh, what's happening? Oh, the Azerbaijani military is doing some exercises with landmines and missiles and things in the area you need to leave. And we went, yep, all right, you're right, let's go. <laughs> and I we left. have an Azerbaijani military story. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Look at the Turkish border. <laughs> Well, I mean, you guys, if you're in archaeology, you'll end up on a project where you'll have unexploded ordnance that you have to work in. Um, I think one time, Josh, did we, like, we found like a, an actual like bomb, not just like a UXO in the ground, but like a bomb where they were like, turn off your sat phones, turn off your radios, like we were, run away the other direction. We were surveying around the edge of the lake and like, I don't know, four or five inches into the water, like crystal clear, you could see through it. You could see the tail fin sticking off this thing, like a Nerf football kind of nerf nose down in the mud in that space um, as we were like looking for things around. Yeah, so sometimes that happens. Turns out you guys, like, uh, not not even that long ago, like only 50 years ago, they like were like, let's blow this stuff up, but then not right down where we sit. Oh yeah, the military will do whatever. That's like, or surprising and shocking. Or even in urban development, buried propane tanks or um, old gas stations, um, all the kinds of fun stuff you'll run across on survey that, that hey, we're going to call the hazmat team. So take the rest of the day off. Yeah. All right, I do have a question on the chat. Uh, Erica asks, can anyone give some advice on narrowing down your interests? I feel like some things mentioned tonight, like gaining as much experience as possible, would just make my interests more broad, more broad. So what are some ways the panelists narrow down their interests if they have to? The classes that I got A's in. <laughs> <laughs> the things, no, really, honestly, the things that I was good at. I was, for whatever reason, really good at remembering what bone was what. I mean, I really, I knew that I loved skeletons and stuff, but I, I didn't know that I was going to be good at it. But then it turns out I was really good at it. Like I was really just, you know, it, it, it came to me naturally. So, you know, I was interested in history and all this stuff in general, but what really, you know, stuck the easiest is what I wound up, you know, focusing on. Yeah, I mean, ceramics were what I found rich, most interesting. So that was where I kind of, I did the lithic analysis. I did groundstone analysis and all of these things. And then, but ceramics really resonated with me. I really enjoyed it. Um, and at that point, I became a ceramicist with a skill, and it was like, hey, you want to come to Turkey? Um, and hey, you want to go to Syria? And then now, then it was Peru, and now Bolivia. And so it's kind of one of those things that um, having that specific skill let me kind of then narrow things down. Um, but don't worry, your master's, your PhD, um, they'll narrow that down for you. It's, uh, pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. And you'll definitely make it by the end of that. So. Oh, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Kind of. Um, I just want to like offer something that's like a little bit different, a little bit different of an approach. Um, it's okay to like want to do one million different things. I still, you know, want to do so many things with my life. And if I could like re, you know, if I could like reset and like rewind, um, there's, so, you know, I would love to live one, you know, 100 like different lifetimes where I chose you know, interest A over interest B and then try out C and D. And I'm like, I, I still, you know, that's just how I am as a person. So I like, I understand that question. And I want you to know that there's a lot of ways to reach the summit and think about like, what if instead of thinking, thinking about it differently, like what if you thought I can't make a wrong choice, what would you want to do? Because you kind of, 
I mean, unless you're like really bad at something, then you can make a wrong choice of going to the mail. Maybe not do that. Um, but I, I would like suggest a shift in perspective and start thinking like, instead, um, what do I want my days to be like? Instead of like, what's my path from A to B to C to D? Um, what path would I maybe like enjoy spending my days doing like on the day to day? Does that make sense? And also like, it's okay if you, like I super love bones. Like there was a, there was like a minute there where I was like, I want to do human osteology. And I did, you know, I worked as a volunteer in an osteology lab, um, helping someone with their research. Cause I was like, yeah, I want to do this. You know, I did, I didn't end up doing it, but I also like didn't fail. Like my life is not like a failure because I missed my calling. So just like, don't stress so much, I would say. Yeah. And what, whatever interests that you have at one point, they'll always build on each other yeah. because you'll, you'll go, Hey, I was super interested in geoarchaeology. So there was a time where I went out there and I studied every calcite deposit I could find. It didn't matter where this calcite deposit was. I was going to find it. Um, absolutely no relevance to what I do now, but I, I guess I still have a really nice calcite, um, collection if any of you all are interested. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's no, there's no wrong answer because you can always pick another interest. It's, there's nothing that says you can't have 15. There's nothing that says you can't only do one thing for the rest of your life. So do, just do what you want and then change if you want to change. And sometimes the generalists are also very useful because they they have cross, uh, what do you call it, only cross practice, cross? cross Disciplinary. Interdisciplinary and cross train. Yeah, I'm just thinking of Reebok and stuff. <laughs> uh, when you know, when you cross train, uh, you know, you just you're oh, you could also be very useful if you have a lot of different things that you can connect together. So, oh, sorry, one last thing too. If you have an interest that is outside of archaeology, if there is a hobby or something that you're mm -hmm. interested in, that, that find a way for that to also be applicable in archaeology. So I used to do glass blowing for quite. a Quite a long time and naturally when i started to do archaeology I was like, hey actually you know this roman glass looks really cool or this medieval stained glass looks really cool i know something about this already from having practiced it as a hobby and that was actually really invaluable sometimes for archaeologists who were like well how did this thing get made well i could offer some of that experience on the other end of it maybe not necessarily the material itself or something like that so if you have a hobby just see how that can translate maybe into archaeology in some form in some field of study. It probably can. It definitely can. Yeah, are, you, are any of you good at art? <laughs> oh, you yeah. can do you can do archaeological illustration. It is a thing yeah. that, I, that I pay people to do. Yeah. Yeah. Very good money to do, actually. Yeah. I guess uh, one last question for me. Like you mentioned several places to look or if you're interested in to going into archaeology as a career. I was wondering if you had uh, any more suggestions on kind of where to look for jobs in archaeology or related fields. Oh, you know what? One I think that we didn't that I didn't bring up, um, and I'm gonna like roll my roll my eyes at myself when I say it is LinkedIn. It's such a strange and bizarre place, but <laughs> um, a lot of job like a lot of people advertise on LinkedIn. Um, so there's a lot of like TikToks and internet resources that can tell you like how to set up a grant or like LinkedIn that looks nice. Do that. It's, it's, and if you guys don't know what that is, it's like Corpo Facebook. It's like, it is like there to me. It's like Corpo. Like corporate. Oh, like, got it. Okay. I thought like, work, like Facebook for your work. <laughs> um, so, so like, that's what, that's like one thing, one resource that I know that we didn't mention yet. Um, Sometimes, like, uh, the survey posts things on Facebook, actually. <laughs> Sometimes, like jobs. Oh, yeah. Y'all do. We don't. Only our jobs. Yeah, only our jobs. But... The society does. Oh, sorry. But their own jobs. Yeah. But I mean, you know, Forest Service posts their jobs. They're getting better at it Our because um, we have good heritage program managers right now. So I think they post their, like, there's sometimes, uh, summer jobs that are well paying i think in, in some of these uh forest service jobs i mean and you know of course there's only summer jobs but again build on that experience and i think it would, it would be great so, so that some of that is a networking thing too it's like sometimes i get jobs i send them to the anthropology fac faculty they send them to their students so mm -hmm. yeah 
Yeah. yeah, that goes back to the relationship building, getting. Several times. I give you every job I get. Josh, are we missing any that you can think of? No, but I would add as sort of like a two cents in terms of like looking for jobs or whatever, especially in those early level CRM architect positions. Like a lot of what you'll be working early in your career are these kinds of temporary jobs or seasonal hires or something like that. That's not uncommon. In archeology, span we get on a real cycle where you sort of like get picked up in the spring, work through the fall, right in the winter in January when it's dark and cold and then sort of get back out into the field, which kind of like makes your life a little up in the air when you're contract to contract. But the flip side of that is that you can do anything for a summer. And there's so much like public land that are looking for pe public lands that are looking for people or private companies who will like send you to the West or Alaska or like, do you want to work in Yellowstone? Like, do you want to go to the Tetons? Like archeology span for me was a real window to seeing a lot of the world that I would not have seen from Benton High School and especially the like wild spots in it. So while you're young, while those are the positions that you're filling or whatever. Don't while you're really good at being poor. Yeah, yeah. you never to pick something weird. Get yeah. out of a car, like get a job in a park and sleep in a tent. Like this is the time to do that stuff. Um, and we can help you find those places. Yeah, I know a job in Virginia that's looking for people if you're willing to take $19 an hour. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you wouldn't have to jump down the well. I think you're a little bit too large for, for that particular one. Oh, I've always looked back very fondly on those little oh, shovel bump yeah. things. So, <laughs> yeah. when, when we were on attach and yeah. it was two weeks in Colorado followed by four weeks in Texas and then on up to Montana and that's yeah. a lot of fun. And uh, I would and I would say it sounds like your work to me it sounds like you're a little bit worried like putting the cart before the horse. Once you get your first your first tech job, you have connections to get to get tech positions at any firm at any firm because you'll work with other people who also work for other firms and they'll be like, hey, if they like working with you, they'll be like, hey man, like yeah, you know, we, there's a position hiring at my firm. And like there's your in with that firm. Um and like to echo what other you know, what James was saying a little bit about like what Josh was saying, you know, um, that it like one advantage while it seems like, oh, like $20 an hour sounds like not very much, but you take when you're like a seasonal, when you work seasonally, like as a field tech, you can take whatever time you want off. So the, you know, when I joined this company, the first project that I went in, the, um, the first project that I went out on, the person that I worked with was a crew chief who worked for several several firms and she took the spring off because she was a like um she was a professional um jouster at uh, renaissance festival so oh, she like traveled oh, the nation okay. she traveled the nation like with her horse um like <laughs> as a jouster at like renaissance festivals i know but so so she was like yeah i just like make my scratch you know for like six months out of the year take a month i take a month off i do the tour cir circuit and then like it's life that works out for me i get to like um i get to do two things that i love i can't believe that i'm not making that up oh, wow that was, that was good so like live your best life now before, <laughs> before your knees get out is what yeah. i'm saying and or you as, get jousted. Well, you get jousted. And, and, and as you get older and get settled and you know start having a family and those types of those those weeks on the road become harder and harder, which is why a lot of people do choose to move up the ranks because it becomes a little bit easier to stay home and focused. Um, you get in, you get into your forties and you start realizing you're missing too many little league games or whatever else. Like in, in that, and within that, you start moving up. And that's your opportunity, right? So the same time I mentioned this is where you want to be it's why that entry level job is where you really get the archaeological hands in the dirt experience well it is 755 so unless there are pressing questions i think thank the panelists for coming tonight thank you for all your answers and we'll wrap this up